For my thoughts on all the latest happenings in the NFL in a completely relaxed, unscripted format, be sure to check out my channel, JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. This player right here is Doug Plank. He's fondly remembered today for his time in Chicago, especially considering the fact that he was a 12th round pick. There were 26 players taken in the 12th round of that 1975 NFL draft, and only 9 of them, so roughly one-third, even so much as played in the NFL. Plank did more than just play in this league, though. He spent 8 seasons with the Bears, started 96 games, was named one of the top 100 players in the over-century-long history of the Chicago Bears, and would be known not just for his ability to intercept passes, including a critical overtime interception on the final week of the 1977 season against the New York Giants to help send the Bears to the playoffs, but for his ability to destroy receivers and deliver the wood. He was as hard of a hitter as they came, and if he was in your general vicinity and you were a wide receiver, you knew that you were about to feel punishment and be in some serious pain. Doug Plank was a great safety, and might have an argument for being the greatest bear of all time to never make the Pro Bowl. However, even though Plank was a great player, the Bears were, more often than not, a pretty bad team with him on the roster. Plank played with the Bears from 1975 to 82. In those eight seasons, the Bears only made the playoffs twice, and didn't win a single playoff game or a single division title. In those eight seasons, the Bears had a pretty middling record of 53 and 62, winning only somewhere in the ballpark of 46% of their regular season games. And after one of those losses, a 1979 loss to the New England Patriots, he made some, shall we say, bizarre comments where it seemed as though he blamed the fans for being the reason that the Bears lost the game. Because the fans weren't into the game, I guess? A game in which they lost and didn't play well and the fans had nothing to cheer for? Yeah, it's a bizarre moment that deserves a deep dive 45 years later. Because this is the story behind one of the strangest fan-related controversies in the century-long history of the Chicago Bears franchise. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, and what exactly Plank said about the fans that left many people scratching their heads, we need some context to understand the importance of the game at hand that was just played, and how said game went. It's October 14th, 1979. It's week 7 of the NFL season, and as we're heading to the halfway point of the year, we've got an interconference battle on our hands between the New England Patriots and the Chicago Bears on what is a beautiful, crisp fall day for football at Soldier Field. This is a pretty big game for both teams, and there's a reason that you've got Dick Emberg and Merlin Olsen on the call for it, because both teams could absolutely use a win here. For the Patriots... The good news is that they enter this game sitting pretty with a 4-2 record, and look like one of the best teams in football. In fact, from a point differential standpoint, their point differential of plus 56 is the best in the league. The bad news is that there are a ton of other teams in the AFC right around them, and in a conference where only 5 teams make the playoffs, there are 8 teams at this very moment with a record of 4-2 or better, including the Miami Dolphins in their own division. Win this game, and you head into next week's clash against Miami with a chance at first place in the division. As for the Bears, this is a team that's been struggling pretty badly as of late, losing three of their last four and having one of the worst offenses in football, having scored just 88 points through six games, or less than 15 points per game. That was the second worst total in the NFC and was one of the bottom five totals in football. Still, the Bears are 3-3, three and three, only one game behind Washington at 4-2 for the final wildcard spot. So if you win this one, you could keep pace for a playoff spot. Lose this one, and you'll definitely have your work cut out for you, seeing as there's no way you can enter the second half of the season with a winning record. And in this interconference battle, it honestly wasn't even close. This game was complete and utter domination from the moment the game started. Literally, on the second play of the game, the Bears fumbled the ball and gave it to the Patriots. On New England's first two drives, they scored two touchdowns. On Chicago's first two drives, they turned it over twice. There was no point in the contest where the Patriots trailed, 
and outside of nothing nothing at the start, no point where they were tied. Outside of one play from Chicago, a 54-yard touchdown pass by Bob Avellini to Dave Williams in the second quarter, there was not one moment where it genuinely looked like Chicago was posing any sort of offensive threat. The Patriots won this game by a final score of 27-7, and took that 14-0 lead that they built up after the first quarter, and just ran with it. From a yardage standpoint, the Patriots had more than double the yards that the Bears had, winning that battle 360-169. The Bears played incredibly sloppy and undisciplined football, as not only did they turn it over twice, but they committed nine penalties. The offensive line could not protect either Bob Avellini or Mike Phipps, as combined, the two men were sacked five times by New England's pass rush. And in the most telling stat of them all to give you an idea of how bad the Bears looked on this day, Chicago finished the game with five first downs. That's it. Five first downs, including just one in the second half. I want to give you some perspective on just how bad that is. Obviously, five first downs in a game is awful. The average team in 1979 picked up 18 and a half first downs a game, which is surprisingly enough, about in line with what the average team picks up in 2023, even with the offensive explosion nowadays, as today, the average team picks up 19.2. So you can't even use the argument of, well, it was a different era. No, five first downs is five first downs. It's abysmal no matter how you want to slice it. When you get sacked a lot and can't run the football and drop a ton of passes, that will do that to you. At this point in the season, there had been 97 games played across the seven weeks. The Monday Night Football game that week had not happened yet, hence the odd number of games. This means that you had 194 teams lining up across the seven weeks trying to get some first downs. And the absolute worst of the bunch across the first seven weeks was the Chicago Bears on this day in 1979 against the Patriots. It was tied for the fewest first downs by any team that season at the time, with the only team in the same stratosphere as them being the Buffalo Bills, who had five first downs in an opening week loss to the Miami Dolphins. You almost have to try to be bad enough as a professional football team to muster up just five first downs in an entire game. No matter what the Bears tried on offense, it just wasn't working out. And as you can probably expect based on that, and judging from these highlights of the game, or lowlights if you're a Bears fan, if you were one of the 54,000 fans in Soldier Field for this game, you were not too happy. In fact, you were pretty quiet, because there wasn't a lot to cheer about. Sure, you cheer for the long touchdown in the second quarter, and you booed whenever the referee made a bad call against your team, or maybe even when Bob Avellini wasn't benched at quarterback, but for the most part, you were pretty silent. I'm sure if you've ever watched your team completely lay an egg in an uninspiring effort, where nothing happens offensively, you can relate to that. You're relatively silent, and you don't make a whole lot of noise. And safety Doug Plank? Yeah, he wasn't having any of that. Because in his eyes, the fans were, at the very least, partially responsible for the Bears being bad and laying an egg. How dare the fans stay silent during this game? We're at home, and we have nothing to go off of from an energy standpoint. The fans deserve the blame for this team losing by 20 points, never leading or tying at any point, turning the ball over on the second play of the game, and posting five first downs. Said Plank after the game on the Bears fans in their silence, I am certainly aware that our fans have been flat to say the least. Ohio State head coach Woody Hayes always used to tell us that when we played a row game, the object was to make the fans sit on their hands. The fans sure sat on their hands here during that loss, and I know it wasn't that cold. My brother was at the game, and he said it wasn't cold at all in the stands. He then added, A home crowd can have an awful lot to do with how a game is played. It literally can take control of a game. I guess the people of Chicago have just had a letdown since the Pope left town. For some context on that, Pope John Paul II visited Chicago the week before, visiting from October 4th through October 6th. But if you thought that was bad, oh, it gets worse. It gets way worse. As Plank continued for some reason, during the afternoon, 
I had to look up into the stands a couple of times to see if their eyes were still open. Silence is something else, and it's hard to put a finger on the reasons for it. Maybe our fans are coming to the game expecting bad things to happen. Maybe the fans are bored with our team because it isn't living up to their expectations. It's a possibility they come to the park thinking we'll be conservative on offense, and they aren't in a mood to cheer. Wait a second, time out! You think fans willingly spend money to go to a game, and they decide upon entering? You know what? I'm just not gonna cheer today. Don't really feel like it. Dude! You scored seven points! Your team had five first downs! Maybe they expect bad things to happen? I mean, they're realists! They're 100% right! Can't blame the fans for thinking something that ends up happening! But, come on! You're really gonna blame the crowd, and question why they weren't cheering, in a game that you lost by 20, and mustered up five, count them, five first downs? I'd wager that of the 54,000 fans at the game, unless Jason Pierre-Paul was also there, that all 54,000 of them could count the number of first downs you guys got on one hand. Of course they're not going to cheer for that. No one would. No one in their right mind would. You're going to blame the fans for not cheering after incomplete passes or one-yard runs that go nowhere? Have you ever watched any football game before? I know you played football for a while, and I know you've been in the NFL since 1975, so this wasn't your first rodeo. But come on, give me a break, man. Naturally, other members of the Bears thought that Plank was taking crazy pills, and said, hang on, we're not blaming the fans. Why the heck would anyone cheer after that game? Fullback Dave Williams said, basically, fans do not dictate the kind of football we're playing. It's up to the players to perform. And head coach Neil Armstrong said it best, saying, I know the people who come to our Sunday games here are for the Bears. But for fans to get excited, you have to give them something to be excited about. I'm as disappointed as the fans over our poor play. And we didn't play poorly. We were boring because we were not successful. We just didn't get enough plays to make anything exciting. Thank you, at least common sense prevailed among other members of the organization, I don't know why Doug Plank didn't get the memo that in order to get fans cheering, you need to give them something to get excited about. And I don't think it's unreasonable for a fan base to not get excited over this game and to expect more than one first down in the final 30 minutes of the contest. Just a crazy hunch, though. The funny part about all of this is that after the game between these two teams behind me right here, Chicago Bears fans actually had more to cheer about than New England Patriots fans. The Bears ended up making the playoffs that season, as on the final day of the season, against all odds, they beat the St. Louis Cardinals, made up the point differential they needed to surpass Washington, and had Washington lose to Dallas. It was one of the craziest final days of a season ever, and you can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. As for the Patriots, yes, after this win, they were 5-2 and two, were sitting pretty, but they were pretty mediocre down the stretch. They ended the season with just a 9-7 record, and they missed the playoffs. And if Bears fans had any hard feelings about the Patriots after that game, well, I think all hard feelings were cleared, and all hard feelings were water under the bridge after Super Bowl 20 a few years later, when the Bears absolutely destroyed them. So what do we learn from all of this? If a team loses by 20 points, and musters up 5 first downs the entire game, odds are, it wasn't the fans that cost you to lose through their silence. If you want fans to cheer you on, you have to give them something to cheer for. And criticizing the fans for not reacting, or reacting by not expressing anything, is really dumb. Whether you're a Bears fan or a fan of any other team, no one, not a single sane person, would cheer during and after a performance like that. Not one person. Doug Plank was a heck of a player, but at least after this game, for his downright nonsensical comments bashing Chicago fans for no reason, Plank should have walked the plank. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe, as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9pm Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, Subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. 
Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.